right. Well, it's it's 1002. So like I said, again, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to intro yourself in the chat. Um, just a couple of housekeeping remarks uh, this morning. So I'm Tessa O'Connell. I'm the, the Communications and Public Outreach Ma Manager for the Natural Areas Conservancy. Um, thanks for joining us for another virtual event. Um, I will hand the mic over to Sarah, our Executive Director, in just a minute. Um, but I want to encourage everybody to use the chat function throughout the presentation. If you have questions about what our panelists are talking about, um, want to know more about a particular topic, the chat is the place to do that. Um, we are also recording this uh, webinar, so if you want to go back and watch it or share it with somebody who might be interested, um, that recording will be available shortly after this event. Um, so that's that's pretty much it, and I will turn things over to Sarah. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tessa. It's really nice to be with all of you this morning. And as Tessa said, I'm Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm the co-founder and the executive director of the Natural Areas Conservancy. And I'm really excited to be joined today by Assistant Commissioner Jennifer Greenfeld from New York City Parks and Rob Frieden, sorry, Rob, I always stumble a little bit on your last name, Frudenberg from the Regional Plan Association. I'll let Jennifer and Rob introduce themselves further in a moment, but um, wanted to just set the stage a little bit for today and say that um, today is our first public event about the wetland management framework, which is a joint project of the Natural Areas Conservancy and New York City Parks. And Jennifer and I will um, provide a little overview in a moment, but I'll, I'll just say that this is a um, an effort that has been many years in the making, and we're excited to talk today about a multi-decade vision for the future of wetlands on New York City Parks property and to describe how um, past investment in these wetlands and um, the investment moving into the future really set the stage for the kind of resilient and biodiverse city that we are excited to envision. And with that, I'll hand it over, um, Jennifer, to you and then to Rob to just briefly introduce yourselves. And then Jennifer and I will provide a brief overview of the framework. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Rob. I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, I'm the Assistant Commissioner at the New York City Parks Department of Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources. I have the great pleasure of thinking about planning, restoring, caring for 10,000 acres of natural areas, as well as street trees. And uh, we have two nurseries and um, great uh, scientists and ecologists on my staff. And I've been at the Parks Department for almost 24 years. Uh, so I've seen a lot over my time here, um, including you know, a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm, my background is in forestry, but I have, um, you, you can imagine over 20 years of, of, of living and breathing parks, natural areas, wetlands are now also uh, in my soul as our trees. So glad to be here. Rob. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Rob Freudenberg, uh, Vice President for Energy and Environment at Regional Plant Association. Uh, thrilled to be here with you this morning and, and to be in conversation with Sarah and Jennifer. Um, just real quick, um, you know, RPA uh, covers a lot of topics, uh, but wetlands is indeed one of them. Um, I see my colleague, uh, Ellis Calvin, in the audience, uh, and I work together on a uh, a regional look at wetlands migration. Uh, so this issue is is close to our heart, uh, and we have mapped the historical wetland loss uh, throughout the entire region as well. Uh, so we are very focused in. And then personally, uh, just a, a quick aside, um, you know, I, I went to the School of Forestry in in Syracuse, New York, um, and I was kind of lost in terms of what I wanted to do with that until I did a, a summer field study on wetlands management um, in Baja, uh, California, of all places. And that kind of uh, focus on wetlands and, and the mangrove forest there in particular got me really focused on coastal issues that's kind of led to the, the path I'm on today. So wetlands hold a, a really particularly close uh, place in my heart. So glad to be here today and uh, really looking forward to this uh, overview presentation. So I'll hand it back to you all for that. Thanks so much. So I'm going to do a, a screen share. Um, and as I said, I do a couple of quick slides to kind of set the stage a little bit for um, what we'll be talking about for the next hour. So just to introduce the wetland management framework, we thought it would be useful to give a little bit of context about 
the state of our current wetlands, sort of where we started and where we are today, um, the image and apologies for the low resolution of these images. These are actually um, pulled from the framework itself, but the image on your left is an image of um, the historic wetlands in New York City. This is actually kind of zoomed in on the island of Manhattan, but you can see on the right hand side, um, Brooklyn and Queens and the southern portion of the image and the Bronx and kind of the um, center. And the thing I wanted to highlight here is just that when we think of our wetlands um, today, we frequently think of of salt marshes around our coastal areas, but the historic landscape of New York City was um, was a, a landscape with a lot of water, both on the interior and on the edge, including um, intertidal areas that were much, much more vast than they are today, areas that um, moved into or encompassed whole neighborhoods that are currently built upon today. And we are looking today at a landscape that looks more like the landscape on your right hand side. The green areas are New York City parkland. You can see a lot of the um, wetlands that we still have in our city, especially in the interior of the city, exist on parks property. And we are looking at a landscape with significant alterations from our historic past. So we've lost 85% of our historic wetlands over the last 100 years and 99% of our freshwater wetlands. And one of the things we'll highlight today is both the incredible value that these remaining wetlands have for the um, protection and sort of well-being of our city, but also the incredible repositories that they are for biodiversity and nature and the opportunities that they present for New Yorkers to connect with these um, re remaining systems. So as I, um, we've been talking about, uh, we've lost a lot of wetlands, but we still have, you know, um, significant pieces of quality habitat in New York City. And New York City Parkland Parks Department manages about half, and um, this um, management framework, which we'll you know sort of get into a little bit deeper later, is is um, unique in that it looks at all the wetlands resources again, not just the salt marshes, um, but and not just the streams, but also the freshwater wetlands, and so. Again, about half of each of those categories is under a parks' jurisdiction. And, uh, and we really see that the framework is part of a continuum of care. It sort of didn't come, whole, we didn't create it whole cloth um, uh, in the last you know, year. It's really a, continua, a continuation of 30 years of care uh, that the parks departments and partners have given the wetland resources across the city. And it started from, you know, a response to an oil spill in the Arthur Kill. Um, and from there really built into an established program where we can look back and say, we've restored almost 400 acres, spent hundreds of millions of dollars, um, looked at really creative ways of protecting and building new um, uh, wetlands. Uh, one example is a mitigation bank we worked with EDC on. Um, and, and not just restoring, but also investing in monitoring assessment across hundreds of acres. We've completed four watershed plans that really look at, again from the stream to the, from the source to the, you know, to the um, end point and the shoreline, um, what can we do within the watershed? And we've also gone back, we've been doing this long enough that it's time to understand what, what has worked and what hasn't. And we've looked at, assessed our restoration projects and documented um, what we think should be happening in the future, how we can approach it in the future. Great, so I'm gonna just give a little overview of what the plan contains, but I'll also just add to what Jennifer mentioned on the past slide. So the natural resources team at the Parks Department, as Jennifer mentioned, have decades of experience working on both research and care of wetlands within New York City. The Natural Areas Conservancy was formed in 2012, and we were formed to serve as a nonprofit partner to the Parks Department to expand 
um, expand on the care of natural habitats under the agency's jurisdiction. And one of the first big efforts that we undertook was a citywide ecological assessment, looking at the condition of all 10,000 acres of natural habitat that the agency cares for. And this framework is the, the second um, big comprehensive framework that looks at the sort of care condition of um, need for care and ultimately investment needed for a large resource. So in 2018, we partnered to produce the forest management framework for New York City, which laid out a plan for the care of over 7,000 acres of forested natural areas um, on parks property. And this wetland management framework similarly seeks to create a, a, a bold but also comprehensive vision for the future of a really complex and dispersed resource. So the plan format um, articulates the importance of wetlands within New York City, describes the risks to wetlands, both from people and from climate change, gives a really uh, comprehensive and useful overview of the regulatory and policy history that has led to the state of the sort of wetland complexes that we see today, um, provides an overview of significant research efforts about the condition of wetlands and the threats that they face, um, and then gives an overview of the approaches to restoration and management that have currently been used and that are being proposed to use in the future. We also include a list of priority wetland projects um, spanning the boroughs and then describe the financial and staffing investment needed to care for wetlands. And that, that set of recommendations spans, as Jennifer mentioned, all the way from the headwaters and our interior freshwater wetlands all the way to the, to the coastline. So with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to hand it over to Rob to begin to moderate the conversation portion of this event. Great. Uh, thank you. And thanks for that overview. Um, first of all, congratulations on this report. It, it really is an excellent report um, from the content uh, to the graphics uh, to everything within it. Um, so I'm really thrilled that we have a chance to dig into it a little bit more um, and just, just to remind folks that you will have time for questions as well uh, so we'll we'll be talking for 25 minutes or half an hour or so but please do submit your questions so we can get everybody in on this conversation so you know you touched on it a little bit Sarah but um, you know obviously we're we're fans of wetlands uh, the audience is probably fans of wetlands but maybe not everyone gets the sense uh, you know I guess my first question is why wetlands and, and why now? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I think I'll sort of give a two part answer to that question. I think at the time that we set out to create this framework, we were really focused on articulating this incredible body of knowledge that we've generated and to use that information and that data, which has never been shared before um, comprehensively, to really do some case making about what we've learned, as Jennifer mentioned, over decades of investment. So one of the things that I think um, both nonprofits and agencies sometimes forget is how much internal knowledge exists and the real importance and power of taking that information and communicating it to new audiences in order to really share the passion, enthusiasm, but also the technical expertise that has been gained through you know, significant time and effort. So the, the original goal was to take this information, new information about the condition of wetlands, new information about how to prioritize projects and where to work, information about the kinds of protection really needed, and to sort of package all of that together into a vision for the future of wetlands that would be compelling for decision makers, for policymakers, for our partners in the nonprofit space. Um, that I'll just say that the sort of time in which this is being released sort of Things with a whole new set of opportunities from my perspective that really elevate the importance of wetlands in a new way. We're um, 
as folks know, we are um, just weeks away from our mayoral primary, and this year we will have an election for a new mayor and for new city council members. And we're also looking at a period of increased state and federal investment in natural infrastructure. And we really view this framework as an incredibly valuable tool for this administration and for future administrations. It's a really thoughtfully put together roadmap for the kind of investment needed to elevate wetlands as a form of essential infrastructure that provides protection for her city, helps us to address climate change, and also really helps us to address um, questions of equity and access to parkland and natural area parkland in particular. So I'd say we sort of started with this desire to share what we knew, and I think we're releasing it at this time where we also have this real opportunity to um, provide this template or roadmap for people in um, power decision-making positions. Yeah, it's almost like you, you, you couldn't design uh, better infrastructure uh, as, as humans, you know, right? It, it does so many, so many things for us already. Jennifer, I want to make sure to see if you had anything to add to that. I mean, as a, you know, you are a, a manager of wetlands by, by being uh, in, over, you know, being in the parks department. Um, you know, is there anything uh, you know, that's particularly important about wetlands and parks or, you know, why is it important that we, we prioritize their protection? Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I'm looking at um, a lot of the participants here, and there are many, many experts on the <laughs> in the group. So I welcome um, that, and hopefully, some people who will uh, sort of take some of this excitement away away with you. But, um, but uh, yeah, we can't kind of forget the basic things that wetlands do in the city in terms of providing wildlife habitat, regulating temperatures, storing carbon. People think trees are the only thing that holds carbon, but wetlands and soils do very much so as well, um, buffer storms. Uh, and there's something about wetlands um, and water and our connection to water. I mean, New York City is a city of water that really um, holds and embodies our history, um, not just cultural history, but our economic history, our recreational history. It's where New Yorkers go and it's why the city is here. And um, and it's not just about the function, you know, getting us from place to place in terms of the ferry, but it's it's like the gestalt of it. It's everything together. Uh, that's very hard to describe. Um, but uh, so I think this just gives us an opportunity to celebrate wetlands in a different way. And today, it's not just history. It's still today we're enjoying them and they're places for discovery and reflection that we um, we need to find ways of highlighting and connecting with people. Uh, and like specifically, you know, there are 300 species of plants in wetlands that wetlands supports. There are 300 species of birds and 200 species of fish and it, they're all connected. So the fish that we're seeing, we're seeing more and more menhaden in the water, which is maybe why we're seeing whales. And that's a movement, you know, that really connects people um, to the water and to their heritage and to recreation today. So all of those things. Um, make wetlands critically important to New York City. That's great. Um, yeah, so I mean, as you're, you're talking, I mean, your report is in, in a way kind of like a, a state of the wetlands um, for the city in, in some ways. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, the state in, in some ways is strong, um, but it's also, you know, the report sites that we're, we're still losing uh, acres of wetlands a year. Um, so, you know, we understand now why, why we want to prioritize our protection, why it's important. Um, you know, how does the framework aim to address uh, still this, this battle we have in, in terms of losing wetlands? You know, what, what can we do to, to protect and care for the wetlands? Um, maybe I can sort of start a little bit from the sort of, um, maybe from the sort of slightly, slightly less technical perspective and talk a little bit about kind of the, I don't know, vision and inspiration that we're seeking to, um, to instill. And then I'll let Jennifer talk a little bit about, there's some very tactical kind of knowledge-based recommendations in here that I think are incredibly useful and important. Um, in terms of the sort of, you know, what do we hope to achieve? How can we, really use this as kind of a, a moment to 
you know, sort of change, um, sort of sort of change the approach. I'll, I will say that from my perspective, now working in this space for a decade in New York City, I think we've gained a lot of ground, especially in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, in terms of acknowledging the power of nature and the need to. Um, acknowledge kind of the, the the force and will of natural systems. And I do feel like we've moved in a direction of not trying to just sort of block off or fight the natural world. I think there's more of a kind of an invitation in, um, but I think there's still a far way that we can go as a city and, and, and as a world um, to really embracing the idea of living with nature, especially in our urban environments, and the idea of thinking about nature not just as a tool in the toolbox, though it is an incredibly important tool in the toolbox to solving um, big problems, but, but also appreciating these places for the multiple benefits that they provide, not just thinking about them kind of on a cost benefit analysis in terms of um, coastal protection or you know, sort of, you know, storm attenuation, but thinking about the kind of city we can have if we really embrace and seek to integrate the natural and built environments in a more comprehensive way. I, I think there's a huge appetite for that and a huge um, opportunity to do that, but a lot of know-how required to do it and to do it well. And I think one of the things I'm really excited about with this framework is that it, I think it, it both, um, we both are seeking to do case making about why investing in wetlands is important, but we're also seeking to provide really concrete recommendations about how to do this work, how to price it, how to prioritize it. Um, and to me, that feels like kind of a really important sort of in, intersection that we haven't really ever s sought to kind of embody before. But I'll let Jennifer weigh in as well. Oh, Jennifer, you're on mute. Damn, thought I could get through without it. There was background noise. Um, I think the original question is how do we go about doing this? And yeah, I liked how you put it that it was, um, that it's like a state of the wetlands report. Like there are some great places um, that are really functioning very well in New York City. So the first approach is just to make sure we take care of those and we protect them and we don't lose anything, right? So that's that's got to be like bottom line. Um, and then um, there are ways of improving the wetlands that are not in the best of shape. Um, so we need to just keep doing what we already know, um, whether it's removing invasive species, um, uh, making sure we're reducing erosion, making sure we understand the source of issues, both quality and quantity of water that impacts the health of our wetlands. So again, looking upstream, what's feeding them and how do we make those waters healthier um, with the appropriate amount of sediment with the, you know, uh, filtered in advance. And, um, and then there's looking at the ones that are really need major restoration. Um, and then there's opportunity to create new wetlands out of a lot of areas that were historically wetlands. So when you looked at that map of have been historic wetlands, not every piece that has been filled in has been paved over. So there are opportunities to take historic wetlands and return them to where they were by removing fill. And it's the it's not easy. You know, there's potential for hazardous um, soil we have to think about, but we've really created a lot of these opportunities. These, we've tested a lot of these things out. Um, so it's creating new wetlands where they're, where they're used to be. And then <laughs> there's predicting where wetlands are going to go because really a, a major threat is sea level rise. And literally the wetlands, which normally um, are fed by sediments upstream, can naturally sort of rise and fall and build as water levels change. That's what's beautiful about them. There's vegetation that holds them. The water quality may, helps maintain everything, um, but we've lost that connection. The sediment is not there as much anymore. And then meanwhile, the sea level is rising faster than it ever has, or it's predicted to. Um, so, so there are two things we can do to attack that. And that is both to think about how to build out. Um, so placing sediment 
Um, and then the other piece is how to adapt the land that's going to be flooded to make sure that they that we can create them. So sometimes it's just a simple berm that if you remove it, the wetland will come, nature takes care of itself. Um, there are areas where we know are designated for buyout post Sandy. Um, so it's not even a question of like, does the community want it or not? We know these properties are being bought out and how can we um, accelerate the restoration to a healthy wetland? So all of those ideas are packaged in this, in this uh, well, it's, I don't know how many pages, 60 pages, it's still a pretty tight document, but it's in there. It is, yeah, no, it's, it was great. And, and you kind of touched on something I was interested in, in talking about, um, which is that you're not just holding the line and just saying, let's let's keep uh, the wetlands that we have, uh, not not lose them. You actually are looking uh, in this report to expand wetlands. Uh, and I think you touched on that uh, a little bit. So if, if there's anything more you want to say about that, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but I think you kind of touched on it, but the, the idea in, in describing what you've described um, is kind of an, an urban wetland system, um, you know, which is a different thing. There's this amazing graphic in the report that kind of shows what what are our wetlands in, in New York City? What do they look like? What are they they fed by? There's obviously all the principles uh, that kind of line up with their their more natural cousins. But you know, how would you compare um, kind of the urban wetland system, uh, including the streams and, and everything compared to the, the more natural system. What do we have to deal with there differently uh, and then in the more natural state? Yeah, it's a great question. So I you know, went to forestry school, but I was always interested in trees and cities and urban natural resource systems. So this question is just like something I've lived with for a long time. You go to forestry school and they teach you a tree is a tree, a forest is a forest. You just have to add in the people when you're talking about urban forestry. And in some ways it's similar, right? The concepts of a salt marsh in, I don't know, I'm trying to think in the Delaware Bay or you know, mid-Atlantic area um, it has the same principles as an urban wetland. But I would say there are two primary differences. One is scale and one is connectivity. So in the city, they're gonna be smaller and they're going to be fragmented and um, disconnected from each piece of it, right? So the stream has been disconnected from the 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 um, salt marsh, right? And or it's been piped, so it's underground. Uh, so all of those things also mean that our as diverse as our wetlands are in New York City, they are also less diverse than you would find in a rural, less impacted wetland. So um, so it's scale. Uh, connectivity, biodiversity, those are the main sort of drivers of difference between the city. But then on the other side of it, um, you get visibility, access, and the like sort of critical importance of wetlands as refuge. So, um, so yes, you don't have the space, but you don't have the space because the people are there. So it gives you this opportunity to connect people with wetlands. Um, and you don't have the biodiversity and it's fragmented, but it also means it's an important refuge for migrating um, wildlife. So those things are added benefits and even more reason that they need to be protected in this city. Anything to add, Sarah? Yeah, I, this is sort of um, like leading into kind of a, a related topic, but I'll mention it here because I think it's useful. I think the one other piece that I'll add that's sort of just I find useful framing when thinking about wetlands, particularly in the urban context, is that New York City's wetlands, if we look at historic maps, have moved a ton. Like we, if you look at maps from hundreds of years ago, the entire Jamaica Bay um, sort of area was like all the way down over by Coney Island. Like that we're, we're looking at systems that are historically very dynamic. And so I think, one thing we've we've thought about and talked about a lot over the last decade in our collaborative work with the Parks Department is the idea of shifting away from thinking of natural infrastructure in the binary of thinking of it as either restored and maintained or not restored. We're, we're dealing with systems that have always been dynamic and that we, because of our, you know, because of our sort of building and um, and great infrastructure have impacted their ability to, to move and adapt in the way that they historically would have to some of the um, climate stresses that we're seeing. And so I think we 
we have a, a bit of a mindset shift to kind of engage with to think about the these resources as um as resources that need the kind of generational care that other forms of infrastructure need, but that 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 care is tailored to what we know about them as as natural systems. So the the challenges that Jennifer is describing about you know connectivity and size, we're we we're not going to like unbuild all of Jamaica Bay and return it to a dynamic marsh that can move and migrate on its own, but we can apply what we know about those natural migration patterns and then take the kinds of investment that we make in other types of infrastructure and marry those things together to create management and restoration approaches that um, have multiple touch points that include monitoring and that in, you know, include generation episodically rather than than a single time. And so I think that's also worth highlighting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It makes me think, um, you know, the opportunity that you're presenting here by, by having this focus on the wetlands in parks, um, given that wetlands are dynamic, uh, but our, our city's edges maybe aren't dynamic, but, but maybe there's more opportunity in a park, um, you know, you'd say that more than half of our city's wetlands and streams are in New York City parks. Um, how does that help the situation? How does this, you know, what, what can we do to manage wetlands better? And what, what do parks give us the opportunity? Wetlands in parks in particular, that may be wetlands outside of parks, uh, we don't have that opportunity. Um, I think I'll take that one. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are so many agencies that, um, touch wetlands, right? So there are agencies, federal agencies like the EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, they're regulatory, the state agencies, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation for New York State, they regulate things. They're looking about meeting a, you know, sort of a standard and you like, again, it's binary, you meet it or you don't meet it. And that's their lens. Um, you have other agencies like the city's Department of Environmental Protection, their job is to make sure that New York City has clean water, right? Again, it has to be, they're protecting our water source in terms of drinking water, cleaning, um, being able to swim or fish. I mean, that's what they're looking at. But parkland, you know, our mission is, is deeper, I would say, um, no less important or no more important, um, but it's a deeper sort of dive into, into our resources. So we both, have jurisdiction over them, but our mission is about protecting habitat, but also making it accessible and thinking about how New Yorkers interact with it. So water can be clean, but if you can't get to it and enjoy it, um, then first of all, we're not being, we're not using the resource the way it could be, right? We're not maximizing everything we can do for New Yorkers because we can't enjoy it. And second of all, um, what was the second of all? Um, it was, it's, uh, if you can't, um, we'll come back to, it'll come back to me at some point. So anyway, Parks is just positioned to be able to put all these things together, right? It's to, to be able to bring what we've done to the public to enjoy. So it's thinking about today's and tomorrow's generation. Um, I, I just wanted to piggyback on that and say one really sort of tactical way that Parks is in a great position to address the movement of wetlands is that at, we we know that due to um, sea level rise, there is a movement of wetlands inland and large parks, especially large parks with natural areas are the places within New York City that are most likely to have the the thing that's next after your wetland be a different form of open space. And so having the ability for a salt marsh to migrate into a maritime forest or other form of natural upland is, you know, our large parks are, are uniquely positioned to have that sort of um, unassisted migration of wetlands into into our more interior sort of portions of our city. And I think that's a place where we are, the agency is well positioned both, both to sort of manage that process, but also to use that process as sort of a learning opportunity that maybe sort of brings us lessons 
um, to other parts of our urban landscape where there is more manipulation required in, in order to allow that kind of movement of, of marshes and wetlands. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, you know, uh, in our in our fourth in our PA's fourth plan, we we proposed the idea of a climate park in the New Jersey Meadowlands, which is you know the opportunity to to see climate change happening. Uh, in a sense, what you're describing is that every waterfront park in New York City uh, with wetlands can be a climate park where where people can learn about the impacts of climate change as they happen by seeing the changes that are happening in, the, in those spaces. Um, you know. In terms of, you know, uh, Jennifer, you were talking about the different agencies involved. Um, you know, I think wetlands are valued and cherished. Um, one way to measure that is by looking at the, the budgets. You know, budgets are not simply a, a chart of funding streams and costs and expenditures. They really do represent a list of priorities uh, for the city and its different departments. Based on that, how, how strongly would you say the city is prioritizing wetlands and nature in general uh, within, within the budget framework? Um, well, from my perspective, I feel like, you know, our team is well supported. We have probably more ecologists on our staff than we've had in quite a while. Um, you know, we want to be in the place where when funding becomes available and, and often a great amount of the funding for wetlands projects because they are pretty costly, don't come from, you know, 100% from city sources. They come from the state and from federal um, uh, programs or for mitigation for, you know, uh, shoring up the uh, uh, seawall or um, fixing a pier, you know, so that's where funding comes in. And, and our goal is to be prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. And so that's what I, I feel like we've done a great job at investing in it. And one thing that the plan does talk about is that we know every, you know, almost every inch of salt marsh in the city and where the opportunities are for restoration, for management, for improvement, and we are ready. And we've been busy. Like we've, you know, uh, used sand, post Sandy money to um, and matched by a lot of city funding to restore uh, Sunset Cove, which is in Broad Channel, and to make a bay. We've, you know, created these. Um, uh, you know, watershed plans. We have a host of ecological restoration, wetlands-based restoration projects all over the place. So we're moving, we're busy, and we're ready for the next step. So I, I, I feel good about that, that we're ready. Sarah? No. Okay, we're, yeah. we're, we're getting pretty, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Uh, we're getting pretty close to audience questions. So I just want to say, if you've got questions brewing, I see a few in there, uh, keep, keep them coming because we're going to switch over in just a few minutes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, um, I completely agree with Jennifer and, and echo the um, echo the idea that the, the, the internal agency expertise on how to do these projects and the staffing commitment from the city to really making sure that that expertise is um, sort of, you know, fully internal is is um, internal to the division it is definitely in place I think the overall allocation to funding of funding for wetland projects does need to be increased relative to where we are today in order to achieve the the goals of this framework and I think we um, as Jennifer mentioned, I think we have an opportunity as a city to do two things. I think one is to increase just the baseline investment of city dollars into wetlands and I would say natural infrastructure generally. But I think the other thing is to con continue to build on a successful um, a successful set of efforts to really marry together funding from different sources to kind of creatively package the financing for the kinds of large scale wetland projects that, that are laid out. These are, they're not enormous ticket items, but they're not small ticket items. They're not, they're not appropriate to be fully funded just out of the city's sort of agency parks department budget. There's a huge opportunity to layer in mitigation funding and federal funding. I think in this in this moment, stimulus funding, there's the Mother Nature Bond Act is going to be on the ballot for $3 billion of state funding to go to natural infrastructure. Um, prioritizing having 
you know, savvy people in, in the next um, administration who are really committed to helping the city to take advantage of those um, different opportunities and to, and to position New York City and New York City's wetlands as important, um, important recipients of those sort of multiple funding streams, I think is also critically important is being done and needs to be kind of continued and potentially ramped up in, in the next administration. That's great. Yeah. So it sounds like we have, we have good staffing, we have good knowledge, we have good uh, wherewithal, but we're, we're poised uh, right now to kind of really take that to the next level with some additional funding that that sounds like a, a good place to be as we're on the verge of, of potentially having funding. So that's good. Okay, I'll ask one more question before uh, turning to some of the audience questions. Um, you know, a couple of times it's come up of kind of getting people engaged uh, with, with parks and with wetlands. You know, in terms of in engagement and stewardship, which as you've mentioned is critical to the uh, protection and expansion of wetlands uh, systems, there seem to be maybe some unique challenges when it comes to wetlands. Um, you know, it's maybe easier to, to rally people around saving trees. Um, you can hug a tree after all. Uh, but you can't really hug a wetland. Um, so in some cases, in fact, they're best if we if we leave them alone. Um, so how do we get people to love wetlands so much that we protect and expand them? You wanna? I can throw out a few ideas. I mean, I I. It's really like any anything to you have to experience. You have to have direct experience with something. Um, I think, and, you know, ideally from a young age, but it's never too late. So we need to, um, and at the same time, I think people are naturally drawn to water. People go to beaches, people want to swim, people, you know, maybe run away from the rain, but little kids run out and jump in puddles. Like people are drawn to water. So we have to be able to kind of uh, take advantage of that inherent interest in water and then make those connections. Make sure that people have good experiences where they go to the coastline. But one of the things the plan does is it sort of ex explains how wetlands and watersheds begin in your neighborhood. So start with where people are, understand where water is, is going. You know, there's a catch basin. Um, I think DEP is starting to look at how we can maybe label them at, at which they've done in a lot of other watersheds like Chesapeake Bay watershed, you know, you go to a, to the drain and it, it reminds you that that water is going there. Um, there will be many, many more bioswales in people's neighborhoods and those are places that capture stormwater in order to clean it before it gets released to the open waterways. So it's finding those connections to people. Um, we're also, we have a lot of volunteer programs. I know it sounds sort of simplistic, but um, you know, we used to many, again, many of our volunteer programs were really uh, around in natural areas, we're really in forests. And now we're figuring out how to bring people to the water, whether it's just picking up trash on the coastline or um, helping put goose fencing up to protect new, um, new newly planted uh, salt marshes or fun, really like one of my favorite activities is like monitoring horseshoe crabs, which you do in a full moon at night um, in the summer. Uh, so finding ways of having people have these opportunities and, and we've been working more closely also with, um, with uh, the urban park rangers in New York City parks with the City Parks Foundation that have some really great programs for um, students around the city too. So, Sarah, the, I don't know what your thoughts yeah, are. Yeah, there, there was two things I wanted to add and, I, and these are actually both themes that came up um, in the panel that I moderated yesterday as part of the Waterfront Alliances conference. And um, the first is just to, I guess, highlight the fact that there, there are already across New York City dozens of hyper local and very engaged community groups who are working on and are active in wetland issues. And I think one of the things that sometimes is sort of um, lost at a citywide scale is the the level of, of, of local engagement that exists around these individual places. Like we're presenting a vision for wetlands as a citywide resource, but there are groups like RISE and the Rockaways and the Coney Island Beautification Project, the Bronx River Alliance that have, you know, incredibly deep connections with their local communities. And one of the things that I think 
um, the city the city is doing but definitely could do more of is really engaging with and tapping into the expertise of those community groups, not just as volunteers, but also in shaping the vision for the restoration and care and plans, um, park improvements, you know, the kinds of kind of big, bigger dollar, um, bigger price tag efforts that are that are being planned and will be planned to really make sure to engage those local experts and to think of um, stewardship and and kind of community engagement as more than just um, and this is not to say this isn't happening. I think again, similar to the funding thing, I think it's like we have a strong foundation, but there's room to grow um, to kind of deepen that engagement and that creating space for local expertise and the love of these places and the care of them to really sort of shine through and be more formally brought into sort of official processes for thinking about how these places will be um, changed and invested in. That's great. Yeah, that's that's. I, I like that idea. Um, both of what you're saying. I mean, to really get people engaged, and there are the groups to to do this, um, whether at the parks level or or the local level. So, that's that's exciting to think about. Okay, um, let's switch over to audience questions. This first question came in a little early, so we kind of touched on it a little. But um, is there anything more you'd want to say about uh, the question? Is do you see an opportunity for support for nature-based solutions to protect and restore New York City wetlands through the proposed federal infrastructure legislation and the EPA? Um, you know, what, where, where do you see the opportunities in that potential federal funding and federal action uh, hitting New York City wetlands? Sarah, do you? Yeah, I mean, that the, the, the one word answer is yes, I think there's definitely opportunity there. I mean, for folks who are following this closely, there's conversations happening today, bipartisan conversations about sort of, um, you know, sort of compromises or changed in the changes in the proposed job and infrastructure plans that will I hopefully kind of get us closer, give us a closer sense of what that sort of final product will be and what those investment opportunities are. But I think both um, both from, from those sort of two bills in particular, and I think kind of a range of other um, stimulus funding, I think there's definitely opportunities for cities generally to receive funding to support parks and natural infrastructure and also to do the kind of creative matchmaking that I was describing between things like new Bond Act funding and new federal funding to really think about sort of how do we package and leverage some of these already scoped opportunities to really take advantage of these kind of multiple funding streams. So yeah, I, I, I feel optimistic and excited about this potential infusion of new dollars into this space. And I think the the Bond Act funding for New York in particular, I mean, it's like you said, it's it's rooted in restoring nature, uh, Mother mm -hmm. Nature. Um, so I think it's you know the, to think of that opportunity if if, if folks uh, don't know about that, uh, learn more about it and and share share the the concept of it because this it's a, it's a really uh, strong opportunity for for our, our wetlands and for resilience in general. Um, there are a couple questions here, I guess, both from Morgan. Um, concerned that the East Coast is sinking. Um, obviously, uh, subsidence is, is an issue. Um, you know, how does this play in here? How do we uh, how do we design or, or remediate wetlands to kind of think about that aspect of well? It's not just the, the sea level rising; it's the fact that our land is is sinking as well. Is, is any thought given to that? I am not an expert, <laughs> uh, admittedly, but I would imagine that the concept is the same. You need to make sure there's a steady supply of sediment, whether it's natural or um, or uh, um, sort of brought in. Um, and we also really you have to you have to study well and plan ahead of time. I'm probably not saying things that people don't already know. Really understand what your target elevations are. What's the appropriate um, uh, species? Uh, that you want to put there, so whether it's high marsh or low marsh, so you can accommodate the changes that you know are going to happen, both creating something that works in the moment, but is dynamic and can adapt. And it's from 
um, as basic as sort of engineering and knowing what's what the situation is, you know, the current conditions, but it's also um, thinking about plant material and source of plant material. You know, we have a native plant center in the um, uh, in Staten Island, the Greenbelt Native Plant Center, whose you know our mission is to uh, collect and store and use uh, a diverse genetic source for all plants that we use in restoration projects. So both locally adapted and also genetically diverse. And those are the kinds of things that build resiliency and adaptability in all, all programs. And it's very, um, it sounds simple, but it really is about designing projects and contracts and ways of procurement that allow you to build systems that are flexible and adaptable to change over time. Um, as you're as you're speaking of that, uh, another question came in. Um, you know, if I don't know if you if you looked at a certain level of sea level rise and in, in kind of coming up with this framework, but you know, by 2050 to 2075, you know, what what are we thinking about? Uh, were you guided by the New York City Panel on Climate Change's uh, estimates? You know, what's the uh, what's the kind of range you're thinking of when you're when you're envisioning this framework moving forward? I am not sure. I think we go by the NPCC in 2050 is what we're looking at now. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Sarah, do you know? I, I think that is correct. <laughs> yeah, it's, and some uh, of my you know, staff here City. on on this slide. If you want to answer, feel free. <laughs> See some folks here. The the great thing about New York City, it's one of the few cities, if only cities, that have its own panel on climate change, kind of you know doing this. So that that allows uh, just a standard to measure all of our work uh, against and and towards. So uh, we're we're very lucky in that sense. Yeah. Um, and unless another question comes in, I did save one of my my back pocket uh, in a way to end on a, on a I, hopeful uh, note. Um, I did see um oh, I did see a question in the Q and A that I thought I would just uh, uh, Sarah might have a word on it too oh, about how Q &A. Can okay. community organizations foster support for funding funding of wetlands and and I will say um, you know as a public agency I'm there's so only so much I can do but I can tell you that with my experience with council members and other elected officials, state elected officials, I, they listen to their constituents and I don't find that it takes a lot to um, uh, move their attention or to, to have them shine a light on something that's going on in their community if they know their constituents care about it. They like to go to events, they like to be seen, um, they like to make people, their constituents happy. So I think it's important to um, to uh, be honest about what you care about, not to be shy, um, and to, again, ground it in your community, the thing you care about, um, and find partnerships with other groups who might have similar, uh, similar interests. I, I completely agree. And I'll just say, actually, as a sort of specific call out to that, this framework includes in the appendix um, a, a sort of table that helps people to know which council districts individual projects that are called out um, are located in. So we've tried to make it easier for community groups who are working on these issues to understand which parks and which proposed efforts kind of lie within their individual council people's jurisdictions. And I'll also plug on the Natural Areas Conservancy website, we have an interactive web map, which has really great information about both the um, distribution of natural habitats across the city, but it's also sortable by, um, by council district and by individual park, and it includes information about both the, the physical extent, but also the condition of those wetlands and forests kind of within each individual locale. And for community groups that are interested um, in learning more, those are two really um, easily accessible resources that help provide that um, that sort of, you know, data or information that sort of pairs, I think, really nicely with the, you know, sort of community voice of, of individual organizations and entities who are reaching out to elected officials. That's great. So maybe maybe as a way of wrapping this up, and I'm I'm sure you'll you'll also want to announce when when everyone else can support. Uh, 
you know, coming through the process of researching it and writing it, you know, what are, what are you each most hopeful for, for the future of wetlands and streams in New York City, if we can go out on a positive note? Um, from a kind of a wonky policy perspective, I would say that we're seeing a lot more openness to experimentation and piloting um, new restoration efforts from the regulators. Um, you know, as I was saying before, we're trying things like adding sediment. Nobody would want us to fill a wetland uh, 10 years. I mean, that's what the, you know, national um, wetland uh, protection acts are about, not filling wetlands. So this is very counterintuitive to somebody who's been in the business for a long time. Um, but because we're learning so much about sea level rise, uh, we're seeing that the regulate, regulators are really open. So I feel like we have a lot more tools than we used to have even just five years ago. Um, so I find that very helpful. And I'm sure Sarah has something more to say about this, but the other piece, which is not related to this plan, but it's seeing um, how people have turned to uh, natural areas and being outside and wetlands during the pandemic. I mean, we've you read about this, we've talked about it a lot, um, but I'm, hopeful that that value is, will, will stick, that people will really remember their experiences in a positive way and come back to them. Yeah, that, that's it's kind of it. I wanted to end on and say we, you know, we did, I would say, not, not statistically significant, but I think kind of, um, you know, significant in terms of kind of the the narrative themes that we heard last summer are, are we have a paid internship program in partnership with the City University of New York and our interns spent time last summer doing in-person interviews in parks across the city asking people about how their use of parks had changed during COVID and we we estimated over a 50% increase on visitation specifically to natural areas based on the results of those interviews and the 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 sort of qualitative things that people reported on you know this is a space where i really feel like i can connect with my children and spend time in a relaxed way being present with them this is a place where i can disconnect from the stresses i'm experiencing right now this is a place where i feel most at home in new york city during this stressful time those messages and that sense of appreciation for these places i i think we are um, seeing a real outpouring of volunteerism and community participation in parks. And I feel hopeful that that will extend to the kind of policy and investment um, increases that are needed to really make this, this sort of collective body of work, wetlands being a, a critical piece of it, but investment in our sort of public infrastructure more broadly, um, a priority moving forward for our city. That's great. Well, well, thank you both for for talking today, for for sharing the report with me ahead of time, so I could get a a good look at it and and uh, see it. Uh, RPA stands ready to to advocate for its uh, solutions. Um, and thank you all for for joining us. This has been a, a really interesting conversation and and one that will keep going on. And I guess Sarah, I'll turn it over to you for any final words. Yeah, I'll just, I wanted to just say thank you so much, um, Rob, for moderating and Jennifer for joining. And as Tessa mentioned in the chat, we'll be officially um, releasing the framework this coming week and we'll plan to send a follow up message to folks who participated in this event um, with the link to the um, to the plan, but I'd also encourage folks to sign up for the mailing list for our website. We have both um, both in person and virtual events planned on this topic and other kind of related topics that might be of interest. So I hope we'll have the chance to interact and um, hopefully see some of you in in person later this year. And it's been a real pleasure to be together with everybody this morning.